All right, you are good. All right. Uh, my name is Ed Fair, and I'm the president and founder of the Commons Board of Prairie Restoration Organization. And I'm going to tell you the story of the Commons Board Prairie today, and I'm going to tell it not with a really tight check PowerPoint presentation, but I'm going to tell it with pictures that tells the best story of this prairie. The story really is about how we've gone from something to from nothing to something in a really short period of time. And, it tell, and the story is also about how with a little luck and willpower you can actually make something happen. So let me tell you what who I'm not. I'm not a biologist. I'm not an environmental scientist. I'm not a botanist. I'm not a range man management specialist. I'm a music attorney. Okay, so five years ago, if you had asked me, uh, uh, told me I was going to be speaking at a uh, prairie restoration conference, I would have said, you know, there's probably about as much likelihood of that as me um, winning the Nobel Peace Prize. So I'm, I'm expecting in the next five years, actually, maybe win the Nobel Peace Prize. So, um, five years ago, I, I didn't know anything about native grasses, native prairies. I wouldn't have known uh, mealy blue sage from the new writers of the purple sage. Um, but I've learned a lot about the process. And I, as I said, actually what I am, I'm a music attorney, but really I'm a crazed and I'm an obsessed birder. So I started birding in about 2001 on a trip to Costa Rica. And uh, I, uh, I got the bug at that point, and I came back to Texas, and uh, I have been a birder ever since. If anyone in this room is a birder, you know that there's life kind of before birding and life after birding, and they're, they're, they're very good. So when I came back to Texas in 2001 after my trip, I, I found this really interesting park with a really long name, Commons Ford Ranch Metropolitan Park. And it had these really weird hours. You didn't really know when it was open, uh, Tuesday through Sunday, and uh, gate was open from one to six, but it was an interesting park. So I began to visit that park, and I started birding there, and I've logged in over 500 trips to that park in about 12 or 13 years. So the park is located about 20 minutes from downtown Austin. The property was purchased by the city of Austin from some shady developers in early 1980. And it is under the administration of the Austin Parks and Recreation Department, even though it's not technically within the uh, city of Austin city limits. But it's really one of the most diverse parks in the whole PARD system and it's one of the uh, uh, still most hidden jewels because people don't quite understand what the hours are and what the access uh, capabilities are. It's 215 acres and it has everything from Lake Austin frontage to a tree-lined creek to St. Edwards Plateau hillside, South Texas scrubby mesquite, uh, Golden cheek, habler, uh, golden cheek warbler habitat, mixed uh, um, ash juniper and oak. But the centerpiece of this prairie when I first started going was this 40 acre field, right smack dab in the center of this, this park. And it, what, what it looked like to me was it, it, it looked like two foot high grass, all kind of looking the same. So I'm going to show you just essentially what this park looked like when I first started going there, and really up until just a few years ago. So I'm just going to let that run in the background, but I want you to remember these pictures here as we go through this process, because these pictures really were taken in 2009. So my relationship with the park grew through the years, and I built up a list of species, 200 plus bird species that were in the park, and I did uh, golden cheek warbler um, surveys, and I led Travis Audubon Society field trips in the park. And my first encounter with actually the first hero of this project was 
with Joan Singh, who is the PARD um, supervisor for this particular PARD, or was until she retired a week ago. Um, I met her because she mowed everything in the park, every mowable inch of grass in the park, she mowed it all at the same time, and it destroyed whatever habitat we did have, it destroyed it all, and especially this cool little swamp sparrow habitat, and she's kind of wiped it all out, so I just went to her and said, look, you know, could you think about maybe doing something differently, and she so quickly said, I, I don't understand, I didn't understand, I'm sorry, happy to do it, she started regulating the way you know, she mowed in the park, and so we became friends from that um, encounter. So. I still but, but was curious about this center piece, this 40-acre center piece. Remember, I don't know anything about grasses, native stuff at this point. Um, it looked kind of interesting to me, kind of like amber waves of grain to me, and I, I, thought, I thought it should have birds in there, and occasionally we would get some birds in there. But in, so in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, I brought this birder friend with me to the park, Byron Stone, who is an excellent birder, um, known well throughout Texas, and he, his nickname is the Sparrow Man, because he knows sparrows, and he knows sparrow habitat. So again, I thought I'd had some sparrows in here, and I thought maybe this would be a good place for it, but um, so he comes, and we do a little birding in the park, and through the prairie and prairie, through the field. <clears throat> and, he, and we had a couple of two or three Leconte sparrows, poster child to me for prairie restoration from the birding perspective, the poster of the bird. So um, he killed it for me. He said, See that stuff out there? He said, That's a bunch of junk. That is nothing but King Ranch blue stem, Johnson grass, Bermuda grass. Birds are coming here. They're not going to stay here. It's like walking on the tundra. They they're, have to stay on the top of it. They can't get down into it. We've seen birds in there, as I said, but they passed on through. So I'm crying and bleeding, and he says, but, you know, wouldn't it be cool if, like, if that field was full of Cytoch's grama, never heard of it, okay, um, we could have 20 or 30 Leconte sparrows in here. And I wish that he never said that sometimes because <laughs> if I'd have just walked away, I wouldn't be in this mess that I'm in with this project today. It's, it's a good mess. Um, but it got under my skin, and I started thinking about it. Why? It's just sitting there. It's been sitting there for the eight years I've been coming there, and obviously for longer because before it was a park, it was a working ranch. So who knows how long it really looked like this. But I... I unfortunately became as obsessed with the idea of what we might be able to do here as I was with, with Bird. So we're moving through 2009 and <clears throat> two things are going to happen <clears throat> excuse me, simultaneously in 2009. I'm going to go to Joan Singh and I'm going to say, as a park supervisor, and I'm going to say, what about this? Can we do something like this? Is it possible to maybe do it? I don't know what it is, but can we do it? And she got completely right on board. She said, I love the idea. Let's try and figure it out. So what you have to remember is that this is a city park. We, I, we don't own anything. We're not like a private landowner trying to develop our property into a prairie. We have to work with the city of Austin all the way through the process. And this was new for them. This is a public park. The city of Austin had preserves that um, where they are protecting grassland and some other kinds of habitat, but they've never done anything like this in a public park at that particular time. So the other thing I'm doing is research. Thank God for the internet. I'm just typing in native prairie restoration, Texas, and stuff like that. I'm just getting all this information, and you know I'm learning what you people. Already know, of course. You know, I'm, I'm learned, I discovered the dramatic loss of native prairies, and I just discovered the impact of that loss on birds and other species that depended on it for for a, a sustenance. That they were all in decline, and I learned what the key bird species were that, that depended on this habitat, like wild 
Turkey, Northern Bob White, Upland Sandpiper, Wilson Snipe, Sprague's Pippet, Wintering Sparrows like Field Sparrow, Vesper Sparrow, Savannah Sparrow, but especially Grasshopper and Lacan Sparrows. Remember Lacan Sparrows for a while. Uh, painted Bunny, Dick Sissel, Meadowlarks, those are all birds that like this stuff and need it. Not that stuff, but native prairies, right? Need them. So I, I learned that, you know, building this, this habit, this idea was initially driven from the birder's perspective. I'm a birder and I wanted more birds in there. But it was a natural progression to say, well, get more birds, you need the right habitat. And this habitat is important for more reasons than just birding. It was important for the obvious reason that it was going away. For, and for all of the reasons that people will be talking about in this, in this, throughout this conference. So that was a real learning experience for me. Um, so in the summer of, of 2009, I discovered that I had missed a really important event. Yeah, so just getting started, right? And I'm typing in there, and I see that there was a native prairie restoration workshop, probably much like this one. It was at Climber Preserve. Never heard of it at the time. It was sponsored by the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. Never heard of them at the time. But I started looking at the people who were on there. I thought, God, what we're trying to do here. So I started trying to find them. And I, you know, I don't know anything about this stuff, so there was no stupid question from my perspective. It was, I couldn't be embarrassed. I didn't know when you're supposed to be. It's like, I'm like, you know, a second grader, right? Just think of it like that, like a second grader asking questions. They're not, they're not embarrassed, usually. Um, so I found three more people. Three people actually responded to me. So they're like these other heroes. They don't even know that they are. But they, they responded, and I'm going to tell you who they are. They're, they're Jim Eidson from Texas Nature Conservancy. He spent hours with me on the phone for free just t telling me about how this might work. And I thought, well, okay, you know, I said, look, here's what we got. Here's what we're trying to do. Help us. How can we, how do we go about doing this? It was very helpful. Um, Aaron Flanders, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, he connected me with other people in the area. He said, you ought to talk to them about how you might be able to do this. Jeff Goodwin, Natural Resources Conservation Service, never heard of it at the time. He connected me with those people in our area and they turned out to be extremely helpful. So I began to build this database of people and information. And everything was like in threes, okay? So there are these like three guys. And, and, then, and then I learned again, the simple stuff. Remember, I'm like second grade, coming into the third grade, and how to learn what you guys know. And there's like three important elements, obviously. Um, there's the removal of the invasives. There's the seed bed preparation, and there's the planting of the seeds. Seemed kind of elementary, I thought. He's right, you just get it out, move it out, throw some seeds on it. And a little bit deeper, I discovered that in that first element, removal of the invasives. Again, what you guys already know, there's three kind of three things, three steps. And they begin to get a little bit more confusing and complicated. Herbicide treatment, mowing and tilling. I'm counting that as one, so I'm keeping. Um, and uh, um, planting. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Getting, we're talking about removing the invasives. So herbicide treatment, mowing, tilling, prescribed burn. What's the order of all that? And do you do all that? Well, everybody said all these different things um, about it. But um, I said, okay, we're getting, we're getting somewhere. There are people doing this stuff out here. And we're so we're now moving through to the end of 2009, and we have a our, our meeting. Joan Singh, part. John Chenoweth, another project hero with Balcones Canyonlands Preserve in Austin, and I met to talk about this project. And the purpose of that meeting was to see if we really could say this out loud to somebody else and talk about whether it might really be possible to do this project. So we realized right then. One thing we did realize was that if we, this, if we really had something here, that we needed to document it as scientifically as we could. We needed to prepare, conduct some surveys, vegetation surveys and bird surveys. 
so that we could see, we can help tell the story before we did anything and after. So I'm, I am proud that we realized that we needed to do that before we had spent, raised or spent one penny on this project. So we'll see in a minute that we actually carried this, this idea through. Um, but so we went, okay, we're, we're going for it. So we're going to have another meeting. So for February 2010, you know, we're only four years back, right? We're still looking like this. We try to invite people. All these people I have from my database, now we invite them. And so we, we had representatives from PART, Austin Parks Foundation, which I'll talk about later, Balcones Canyons, uh, uh, Canyonlands Preserve, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and uh, 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 Native Prairies Association of Texas. That was our first kind of introduction to that group. They came to our meeting. They didn't think we were completely crazy. And, and at this point, we had two volunteers. Me and one other volunteer. So, we were <laughs> um, so the purpose of that meeting was to develop a, a plan. Compo what would be the components of the band plan? Talk about how we could develop it. How were we gonna raise any money? How could we get some partners? Who was going to do this? And could we, how could we start to build some community awareness? So I want to talk to you about the funds first because we had to have some funding. So what I did is send a letter, an email to every birder, conservationist, outdoor person I knew in the area and told them about this project. And sure enough, we got people to step up and give us a little money. Uh, I knew a guy who was the head of a small nonprofit um, uh, wildlife organization, and he wrote us a little check, and that check was, felt really good at that point. And so we had a little money now, and we went to Austin Parks Foundation, get our matching money, and we got enough money to hire uh, Native Prairies Association of Texas to write our plan. Okay, so now we're going to go from space to paper. But the plan really was a very short document that simply identified the three, maybe four steps, side treatment, the burn. It laid out a rough schedule, really short, four or five pages. Rough schedule, and 10 and 11, pretty tight schedule for when we might do this. And it put a few numbers in place of what it might cost us to do this. Um, but the real purpose of the plan was to legitimize the idea of this restoration. It gave us a, a it connected us with an organization that was expert in the field of Native Prairies and they could say, look, here's what you can do to do this stuff. And that helped legitimize it. It helped Joan Singh with Austin Parks and Recreation Department. Helped her say, look, this is a good thing here. And it helped us, us, it's still pretty much me at this point, it helped me say, look, in, in terms of spreading the word to the community and trying to build interest in volunteers, it helped me go, look, this is real stuff. You, we can actually go through these steps and get something done. So from this point, we began to look and build our look at and build our, our partners by contacting these, these organizations and agencies. Part I mentioned Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, John Chenoweth helped us with the survey methodology that I'll talk about a little bit further in a minute. Natural Resources Conservation Service. These people at this point pretty and spent much money on this. NRCS came out and helped us identify the soil type. Sandy Lone, who knew? Can't tell you how long people argued with me about what the soil content really was there, but it really is a Sandy Lone. Again, Native Prairies Association of Texas, I mentioned Austin Parks Foundation. Austin Parks Foundation is this 501c3 link between Austin Parks and Recreation Department and all of the organizations in the city that, uh oh, Oh, I hope it comes back. <laughs> that want to do things in the park. OK? 
Okay, and, and what they, they did with us is they we operated under their 501c3 status. We didn't have to spend the money and go through the trouble of doing that, creating that step. Um, and, uh, and so all contributions, tax deductible. They operated as our accountants, all of our money. They handle our money and they pay all of our bills. But equally or most importantly, they are our primary source of fund, of funding for the project. Travis Audubon Society helped us market and promote this project and helped us with fundraising through field trips. So this, so I'm working through here, this is a really interesting learning process for me. Okay, again, maybe I'm up to, maybe I'm in the fourth grade now. But what I, I, was interesting to me was who, who helped and who didn't? I mean, there are these organizations that were stepping up and helping and, and saying, we're, gonna, we're here and we'll do what we can um, for free or for a whatever you got. Um, but what was equally as interesting to me were the, the organizations and the agencies that didn't help. And, and, and there, there, are, there are organizations and agencies, I mean, I, I, look, I can say this, I'm, it's just, I'm just telling you the truth of this project, this is the story of the project. There are organizations and agencies that, that are right there near the site that have not, have not given us the time of day. There is an organization slash agency that's mission statement is this sits right square in the middle of their mission statement and they haven't given us the time of day. It's not because we haven't asked. We have to ask them. If I was on their board or if I was the legislature, I'd be saying if you're not doing, if you're not at least talking to these people, what the hell are you doing out there? But that's just, that, that's the kind of the interesting side of it. But we, we, got, we got partners. We got good partners, and we kept going, and we kept building partners. So, um, so back to the story. Okay, so we had our plan, right? Our plan is, is to proceed into 2010 and 2011, but now we needed to raise some real money. Now it's going to get serious. So, two two places. Private funds. Now I needed to really start wringing out money from people. So we held a big event, big day in the park, 2010. Okay, we still look like this. Okay, now we're getting up to a short period, a shorter period of time ago. So we lead field trips and walks and all this stuff for kids and activities, and a lot of people come. People come because we aimed at the neighborhood. We aimed at the neighborhood and we aimed at people that knew and loved this park. People in the neighborhood and birders <laughs> who primarily knew and loved this park. So we got some money that was going to serve as seed money. But where were we going to get the rest of the money? You guys know where we were going to get the rest of the money. The evil word of grants was going to have to come up. And somebody was going to have to write those grants. And looking around, <laughs> Nobody else there to write the grant. So, how many grants had I written before that? Exactly zero. But I'm going to tell you that my personal experience. Again, this is the story. I'm just telling mine. The next person may have a different story. There were funding possibilities from public agencies and private sources. Right? Public. It just looks so complicated. We just said, forget it. I'm, I can't do that. So, you know, that's when you, I guess you have to hire people to do that stuff. But the private organizations, nonprofits, and, and uh, endowments that could help us, those grants were just not that hard. I mean, I ended up writing a lot of them. And the story, all you have to do is know your story. You just have to know, tell your story. Told the story and did some research on what the thing was going to cost. So we got some grants. Two major grants in that year in 20 that were funded in 2011. We got a grant from Austin Parks Foundation and we got a grant from Together Green. And Together Green is the um, uh, is a joint venture between Tra uh, um, National Audubon Society and Toyota Corporation. So they funded our our grants to get our, our money to get to our next step. Okay, so now we, looking back at our plan, we got some money. Now, what we began to do here is, is 
again simultaneously in this year. A couple of other things. We began to work on the seed mix, and that's when our other heroes of uh, 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 Native American Seed Company in Junction, they came in to play here. So my, my first discussions were, were with Zenobia Wood and Z at, at Native uh, uh, um, uh, American Seed. And so she, she kind of helped us kind of get, get some, some um, uh, ideas together of what the cost would be. And then we began to talk to birders. And we knew what our soil type was. So I'm going to come back to it, but I'm just going to tell you that we ended up building a seed mix that included a couple of the seed mixes that Native American seed developed. But then we added in a bunch of special stuff. So we ended up with a cocktail seed mix of 72 species. We could have lowballed it and had 10 and just thrown a bunch of stuff in the ground, but that's not what, that's not to, to me, at least what I thought now as a fifth grader, that wasn't what native prairie restoration was really about. It was about really creating a prairie that looked like what it was supposed to look like at that historical time. So the other thing we did was our surveys. Right? We did our vegetation surveys, which nine transects throughout this field, and it showed that about 85 to 90 percent of this was junk. Really, it's closer to 90 percent. It was junk. It was those three invasives or just litter. It was unidentifiable. And we did these bird species, these bird surveys, and I just want to tell you the bird surveys were 100 meter transects. Okay, and we do three, we walk these transects with the, these long poles. Maybe maybe the picture's been up there somewhere. Have you seen it? Yeah. We're walking these transects. So, um, so you do 300 meter transects in the winter and you do it three times. So you're really covering, you know, 900 meters. And so our first pre-restoration bird survey, how many birds do you think we had? Two. You are so close. <laughs> one. one. One lonely sedge The weird thing about a sedge wow. um, So that was really kind of good in reality because it gave us, that was the base. And then we're going to work again. How hard is it going to be to beat one? <laughs> uh -huh. So we're moving into 2011 now. And we had a few stumbles. I was trying to graduate from fifth to the sixth grade. I think I might have failed. Maybe got put back in fifth grade again because we had a, we had a few stumbles. No prescribed burn. That was part of the plan. Couldn't do it. Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve that was going to help us lost their burn boss, and it was a terrible drought, and we didn't know what else to do. We were, we were all in fifth grade for this. Whoever was involved, we just didn't know. So the ball was rolling. We kept going. We had some site preparation issues. They're haunting us to this day. Yeah. I didn't do a great job of supervising. I delegated some of the herbicide treatment, and it didn't get done particularly well in some sec far the north and the eastern segment of the prairie. And PARD, which we were depending on to mow and um, till, they kind of waited until the very end, and they had these teeny little tractors and they had a smoothing device that looked like a, you know, a rake from my backyard and <laughs> it, it, um, it didn't work too well. Okay, but, but we're still moving along here. Um, but there's one other big issue. This was a mistake. Kind of. I mean, it really was. It, so I put together this, this written these grants and this plan and we had all these things but we kind of missed one thing. And it was, how are we actually going to put these seeds in the ground? And we didn't have any money for that in the budget. I think that we thought, and I've, maybe I've clouded the picture, but I think we thought, in, in looking back in hindsight, that PARD was going to, we were going to use a broadcast method and we were going to get some help from Natural Resources Conservation Service or Wildlife Department or PARD, and, and that was going to be fine. So about two weeks before its time, plant, I, I call Native American Seed and 
somehow I get in touch with George Cates, who has been our other hero in the project because he has helped us and been a consultant with us, for us, since the day, first day we talked, and they, he has given us far more time and help than, he's, than that company has received for their effort. But what he basically, I, I'm dying here. I'm going, okay, we're just going to buy some seed from you guys and throw it in the ground. And he goes, you're making a mistake. You need to use this no-till drilling process that we have. And so I said, okay, great, but we don't have any money for it. And he says, what do you got? Tell me what you got and we'll work backwards. Okay, this is our number. And he said, all right, we're going to do the seed. You're going to pay this for the seed. We'll allocate this to the planting and the rest of it. Um, we will contribute a, as a, as a, um, labor and uh, um, what's the word? I'm blanking on the word. In kind. Yes, in kind. Con <laughs> thank you. In kind contribution to the project, which they did. So that got us over this huge hump, and we um, so. But the day. That before they were supposed to plant, George and his crew come to town. Here, maybe it's time for me to go here now. Um, it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> so it's, it's a problem. So, so they bring their tractors, this is kind of earlier in the process, they bring their equipment out there and we start struggling to try to make the seed bed better. But there are these gigantic valleys and looks like the Grand Canyon at parts of the, um, uh, uh, in parts of the field. But we proceed on with our, our mix and as you can see, this is the process that they used to plant our 72 seed mix in the prairie. So we, throughout 2012 and 13, we continued to have some issues with some invasives that we began to take care of. The Johnson grass, we managed to virtually completely eradicate. We're still working on the Bermuda grass. And we're moving into 2013 now. Now, first we're going to go back to, we're going to go back to, okay? So we had good rain, good rain, in right after this planting. These are just a few pictures of what it looked like in the summer. Remember what it looked like before. I hope that works. This is what it looked like in the summer of 2012. Okay, we had explosive growth of the init, some of the, uh, uh, what's the term? Yes, yes, thank you. So that, that was in killer incredible to us that this was, was going on. But we wanted to keep going. So we, in, in two big things in 2013 happened. Wrote another grant in 2013. Got some more money from Austin Parks Foundation. And we had a burn. So in August of 2013, we managed, now the word had gotten out on the project. Okay, and we got approached by a burn boss with the city of Austin Fire Department. Oh, five minutes, okay, we got us down. We started late. All right, I'm gonna hurry then, I'm gonna hurry. Um, I'll show you the I'll show you the, the burn quickly. Maybe. So you may have seen this, the burn was great, the results from the burn have been outstanding. Our organization has grown to 150 members. Okay? Not all active members. Okay, there's about 10, 10 or 20 of us that still remain very active in the process. Um, we've funded, and for the coming year, 
we are going to continue to fight whatever invasives that we have um, there right now, and we're going to build a kiosk, and we're going to continue our educational efforts. But I want to I want to show you. I'm going to let this run for just a couple of minutes. Hopefully, we can get through quickly, and then I'll show you because I want to show you where we are today. Um, and I want to tell you about the post restoration surveys. Vegetation survey, post uh, 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 planting survey, flip the numbers. About 80% is uh, native plants. And um, I can't get there. I have to I'm going to see a little fire. There's a little fire. Um, but to me, the most important, interesting result was the bird survey after the first planting. Okay, 99 species from one to 99 species, same, same process. Okay, exactly through the same transects. And you know what the number one species was in surveys? Leconte sparrow. And that's the poster child to us and me. So the results so far have been uh, um, very, very pleasing. And I'm just going to end here with a couple of things. I'm going to let this last um, let this last one go. Just if I can steal just a couple more minutes, because this is what we look like. Come on, man. You can do it. You can do it. Come on, man. This is what we look like right now. Okay, this is weeks ago. This is where this is, we've got things growing in here. If you, you guys know this stuff. You recognize it. We have things that had not grown in the first couple of years. Now, as the succession goes, we're getting more things, new things. Um, and I, I, so, I, so we're still fighting. But again, just back to the first statement, this is just a few people who just really add a commitment to try to make this thing happen and it is a partnership of many organizations and people um, and uh, again we couldn't have done it without people like Austin Parks and Recreation Department they would have said no the first day we would be done but I want to read you I, I, this last quote real quickly it's from uh, Chuck Sexton Chuck Sexton is a recently retired wildlife biologist with Balcones Canyon Lands National Wildlife Refuge okay and so he goes, my wife, Mary Kay, and I are both prairie enthusiasts. This morning was the first morning we've had to drive down to Commons Ford this spring to enjoy the fruits of your and everyone's labor. That is a glorious project, and it looks so amazing right now. I didn't realize how, many, how large the restoration area would be. I've never seen so many lesser goldfinches in one that was so that was kind of fun to hear and see um, and so that's the story today of comes forward but you know it's an ongoing story so hopefully we'll come back and get to tell you more about it later so thank you